This is crazy. All right. This is wild. Yay. All right. We are live. Hi, everybody. Wait, I'm going to see if we are live. It's Oh, it's pausing for a minute. It's thinking. Okay. We are live. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah DeBello, your mighty mystery on-air host. I am thrilled to be here today with Patricia Shanae Smith, author of Remember. Patricia, tell us about your book. Hi. Thanks for having me. Um, my book is called Remember. It's a psychological thriller that tells the story of a young girl who has social anxiety disorder and lost her mother and sister in a tragic car accident. And she grieves with her father by smoking cigarettes and drinking beer all the time. And <laughs> five years later, she ends up getting arrested for a crime that she does not remember committing. That's all I can say. <laughs> Ooh, I cannot wait. Um, so thank you so much for telling us about that book. So I would like to share some of the amazing reviews that Patricia has oh, gotten. <laughs> um, Smith's empathy for her characters makes for a supremely relatable take on mental illness. Remember as an emotional roller coaster of a debut, culminating with a twist that will leave you reeling, says Alifair Burke, New York Times bestselling author of The Better Sister. Crime Reads says, Patricia Smith's work feels necessary. She's as honest in her writing as she is IRL in real life. And that is very honest indeed. Uh, Kelly Garrett says, remember as a thought-provoking character study and intriguing mystery rolled into one, Patricia Shanae Smith is a welcome and much needed addition to the psychological suspense genre. In the search for self in a city filled with many voices, Patricia's Portia is one character you won't forget. Um, Smith's, debut her Smith's debut heralds the entrance of a writing talent to be watched. It's discussion of unreliable memories, ooh, and a toxic father-daughter relationship based on forgetting should please fans of Otessa Moshfeg's Eileen, and I hope I'm saying that last name right. Um, that is amazing, every single one of these amazing. Patricia, do you have a favorite review? Oh my God, all of them. Can you just, <laughs> I, I need to wake up to what you just said every single morning because that was amazing. Um, that's but perfect. I guess every I, day I will text you. Yeah, and that's, all like, I need. that's all I Remember who you are, queen. This is you. <laughs> yeah, no, all like, I, it's a dream come true, what everyone is saying. I never thought that this would happen, that anyone would read my book and actually like it. So I can't oh. pick, I love all of them. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I think every author feels that way, right? You're like, you put your work out there and you're like, please like me. Yeah. <laughs> and then you wait and you just bite those nails terrified. Yeah. Um, yes. So many people, okay, so so many people are saying, con con congratulations, Patricia. So excited for this interview. People are saying, hi, tell us where you're from, everybody. Tell us what your questions are for Patricia. She's excited to be here to chat with us today. Wait, I <laughs> Whatever. That's cool. And she's going to and as we've just heard in her review, she is very, very honest, which is how we like it here. Um, so tell us your questions. Um, and meanwhile, while people are thinking of their questions and typing them, Patricia, tell us about why this book, why now? Why now? Um, definitely, all like all my books, there's an element of mental illness. And I don't think that there's enough books out there that talk about it, especially by Black authors. And so I think it's always relevant because the stigma against mental illness is like just needs to be talked about more and so yeah I don't know yeah I, I so agree with that as someone who has str struggled with anxiety and I speak about that very very openly at national events that I speak with I get up on the stage and I am not ashamed to admit that I have struggled with anxiety my entire life sometimes debilitatingly so um, and I want to work actively to remove the stigma from that. And as my therapist has always told me, the first way to remove stigma is to drag it out into the light and share it. And so yeah, I do that very openly. About it. And I'm really glad. I think it's amazing that um, that someone, you know, is, is addressing that on the page. Um, and as you said, there is a stigma, not only sort of globally and nationally, but also um, racially as well. I don't know, do you watch the show Insecure? I've seen the first season. Yeah. I'm so, to admit that I have not seen the second season. So it's an amazing show, everybody. It is the 
um, the girls or the sex in the city of the 2000s. I, 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 I'm declaring it. <laughs> um, and Issa Rae is brilliant. And yeah. um, she plays she plays a character named Issa in the, in the um, show and her best friend Molly. And there's a scene where Molly's walking down the street and she runs into a friend of hers from college and Molly's like, how are you girl? And she's like, oh, I'm great, I'm in therapy. And Molly was like, oh my God, are you okay? And her friend's <laughs> like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm thriving because I'm in therapy. And Molly was like, she was so horrified that she was like embarrassed for her friend to be in therapy. And so later she's telling Issa, oh my God, the girl we know from college is in therapy. And Issa kind of was like, I think it would be a good idea for you to go. And they get into a huge fight. This is the end of season one. And Molly refuses to go to therapy. But then Molly starts going to therapy. And it really oh, awesome. addresses the stigma of going to therapy, especially um, you know, socioeconomically and culturally and just globally, people don't yeah. want to talk about that, but it's so important. And thank you for addressing that. Yeah, I talk about therapy like probably way too much, actually. No, <laughs> there's no such thing as talking about it too much. Um, and yeah, I just talk about it like it's like drinking water. Like, you're in therapy. What did your therapist say? Yeah. <laughs> My therapist said this. Exactly. <laughs> These are the kind of conversations we need to be having. And thank you for having them on the screen and on the page we need more of this yeah um so how so that so that's how that is something that you wanted to address in this book and this is and you were addressing through this character yeah like speaking up about it because what actually happens in this book is that they don't talk about it and they don't speak about it and it just gets dragged under the rug to the point where like i don't want to say too much but like crime ends up happening <laughs> because it didn't get talked about <laughs> Exactly. So I think that's what we need to take from this, that if we do not start talking about it, crimes may start, <laughs> may start happening. Yeah, um, may. Patricia, may not. Tell, us, tell us about the process of writing this book. What, what was that journey like for you? Were you, did it come easily to you? Were you, ha or were you hacking your way through a jungle? Were you struggling to write it? Tell us, walk us through that. Um, well, I guess speaking of therapy and mental illness, I wrote this book like completely addicted to drugs and on and off the streets. And so <laughs> the first draft of Remember I wrote in a month, but I wrote it completely high on cocaine. And then like it took 12 drafts to get it to where it was. And I will say the last draft I wrote like trying to get sober, um, but it was difficult. Like I, it's, I was just trying to stay alive and stay sober and like just get the next chapter written. And um, yeah, it was, it was really hard. I, I remember like writing the book on friends' couches and like just trying to just get it together, like me physically. And this book definitely helped me like get to where I'm at today. Like I didn't let it go. Like I let go of everything else, but it was like book and drugs, book and drugs. <laughs> I'm not on drugs anymore. Just want to say that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, Cause again, I think it's so important. Thank you for sharing, not just your writing process and your writing journey, but your journey to sobriety. Congratulations, I honor that. Um, that is so, so important and something that so many people can relate to. Um, so thank you for being so brave and so open and so beautiful and so radiant um, to share that with us. That's amazing. Um, that is amazing and people are saying, people are saying, um, people are, are sending up their support and their loves and their hearts on Facebook. Thank you everybody. I can't for see it. For, for sending so many hearts up um, and likes up for for Patricia's bravery and her openness. Um, this is so, so important. And also, I want to say 12 drafts ain't bad. <laughs> I, know. I, think draft. <laughs> I know. I keep forgetting that because I'm in the process of writing another book and I think it's done, but there's only been three drafts. I'm like, man, remember it took 12 drafts. So I'm not even close to being done. <laughs> You're like nine more to go. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Greetings from draft 112. I'd like to be done soon. <laughs> um, Patricia, what is some uh, writing advice that you'd like to pass on? What's some either good writing advice that you got or that you learned from your journey that you'd like to share? And also what's some trash advice that you either got or you just are like, don't do this to our many um, write, uh, writers and readers in the audience? Um, first, I don't think that there's like any bad writing advice. I think what works for some people just doesn't work for others. And I take everything that gets told to me, like I either take it or I don't. Um, but the one writing advice that I guess I will say, the only 
thing that I've done right, because I've definitely done a lot of things wrong with writing, was I just never stopped. Like I started writing at 10, I'm 28 now, and I just never stopped writing. Half of my work is trash, but I didn't let it stop me. And I think that's what we get in our head. Like this book sucks. So I'm not, um, sorry. That's okay. Can you speak? Yeah. Um, this book sucks. So I'm not going to continue writing. I want to give up, which I definitely think about all the time. I want to give up, but then I go, okay, that book sucks. So I'll just start on a different one. And then that will suck. And then I'll start. I just never stop writing. Like I love writing. So I'm just going to keep doing it no matter what. And so I guess if you love write, writing, just keep going, just keep doing it. Who cares if people like it? Even if you don't like it, just continue doing it. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for saying that. And you actually talk about that on your website where you talk about, you know, this is who you are. You're a writer and yeah. you feel compelled to write it. You're not going to stop. And now you have this beautiful book to, to show that and another one on the way in the process, three yeah. drafts in and, and possibly nine to go. <laughs> yeah, it'll be a minute. Um, <laughs> it'll be a minute. That's okay. <laughs> Um, Joyce would like to know what inspired you to write um, and did the book project give you a focus to pull yourself forward? Great question, Joyce. Yeah, that is a good question. Um, so like I said, I was completely in the disease of addiction when I was writing this, but I'm really close with my dad. Shout out to my dad, he's 86 years old, not watching because he doesn't have a computer, but um, <laughs> he like he's my best friend and I was living with him and sharing a room with him and he was taking care of me while I was going through this and it wasn't right like he, he was 84 and I was 25 like completely just like we just had this toxic relationship and he didn't know how to help me and so he kind of enabled me and it was just like bad and good and so I started to just write a book about us just you know a girl and her dad just trying to like make it through and and um then it became this whole entire thing and I don't know how it got to where it is now um just my imagination I guess and yeah I guess what pulled me through is that I just wanted it to be done it definitely it was definitely therapeutic for sure because I knew that if I didn't get sober this wouldn't happen like my dream wasn't going to come true if I didn't stop using so it definitely helped me get to where I'm at today that's really <laughs> cool and what was it like for your now 86 year old dad to hold your book in his hands and to see his daughter as a published author? Um, so he is not one for emotions like at all and he doesn't get mushy, but he did say that like, he always knew it was gonna happen. Like ever since he saw that my first book at 10 years old and he, I remember when he first held it, he was like, oh, this is just like all your other books that he saved, which he should not have saved or really bad um and it's just like he just knew like he knew way more than I did that this was going to happen like he he's not shocked but he's proud of me so you sound like yeah. you have an amazing dad I I wish all girls I wish all little girls today had an amazing dad like yours he sounds wonderful yeah um so what I'm just you know it just made me think as you were saying that he is 86 um, we're, we're going through these very hard, very heavy, unprecedented times of um, the issues of racial justice and social justice finally, finally being brought forth um, for many of us for the first time in our lifetimes. But for your dad, who's old enough to have lived through the 60s yeah. and to have been a mature man and actually to have lived through Jim Crow laws and inequality, um what what has what's how has that been for both of you right now it's crazy because there's like there's a whole thing of COVID and him being an elder so like he literally can't go anywhere so he's kind of feeling like worried about that and then this is going on but I mean this is nothing to him like he's seen way worse and he's just like this is how it used to be like this was back in the 50s this is back in the 60s like he I will say that he is nervous about me I'm going out to protest and he is nervous because of what he's experienced in the past. But then I told him like, dad, it is not the same. Like the protests are super peaceful and they're super nice. No one's like, I mean, definitely the ones I'm going to are not like that. I'll say that in West Hollywood and in Santa Monica, the ones I'm personally going to are not violent and they're very peaceful. And it's also they're being ran by high schoolers and they're yeah. kids. Um, 
so I don't know he's a little like he's he's a quiet like laid back kind of guy he's not the one that's gonna go out and like scream on a rooftop like like he's just not the type but so he's just watching it like he can't believe that this is happening like he can't believe the COVID thing is happening and he can't believe that this whole thing that people are burning cop cars again like you know it's just a lot for him so I'm just trying to be there for him as much as I can and just not worry him anymore (laughs) than I usually do on a normal day yeah so it's such a good point because um actually my beloved friend Bernadine who has adopted me as her goddaughter and allowed me to call her auntie um which um for those in the audience who um who don't know um in the black community to be allowed to call someone auntie is a very great honor um and so my auntie Bernadine um who's a beautiful black woman um whose age I shall not reveal, reveal, nor do I even know it because I would not ask. Um, But I have been texting her to check in on her during these tough times. And she said to me, and she's actually writing a book about growing up under Jim Crow. Um, She's from Philadelphia, but her her parents, her her mom is there from Virginia. So she had roots down South, but grew up in Philly um, where my entire family is based. And so as I've been checking on her every day, um, she, she's been saying to me that she, it's very hard and she's crying and she's suffering emotionally. And she said, you know, I just don't know if I'm going to see the end of this in my lifetime. And I, I hope that I pray that she does. And I'm committed to doing what I can to, to, to make that happen, to marching and protesting and post, posting and speaking out. Um, but I'm thinking for your dad as well, like they've been through this before. <laughs> And I really want this to be the end of this for them. Um, Yeah. You know, and so for your dad, having grown up under Jim Crow, having seen this all before, been through this in the 60s, and then for you at the age of 28, not having seen this before, it must Mm -hmm. be really interesting for you guys to go through this together. Yeah. It's always been like that when we, when, because, you know, I've dealt with racial stuff my whole life. And so we always compare and contrast my whole, like of what it was, what I've, went through and what he's gone through and it's completely it's different it is like the racism I've I've dealt with is have been completely internal and like not what he's been through like it's honestly the racism that I've gone through I didn't even realize that we're racist until probably like the next day or like now like I'm like wait she probably shouldn't have said that in high school right Right. you're like wait that was a micro like that was that was not okay no you know and so it's, it's weird, it's not in my, it's not as much as in my face because of where I grew up, you know? In, so, in LA. Yeah, well, I grew up in Redondo Beach, which is a predominantly white neighborhood. Where? But in- I mean, I have amazing, fr- I have amazing friends, like my friends, like they're all reaching out to me and I'm like, dude, you never said, like, you're fine. Like they are apologizing for like laughing at jokes and stuff. But I mean, we were all just kids, like we didn't know, you know? So I appreciate it. and. I hope that the next generation of kids are not doing that, you know? Exactly. Did your dad grow up there as well, Patricia? No, my dad's grown up everywhere. He was like born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, lived in Rochester, New York, Missouri. I can't keep up. He had a whole (laughs) life before I was born. He was retired before I was born. So (laughs) I always forget that. (laughs) Your dad sounds super, super cool. Um, This sounds amazing. Andrea says, you are such an inspiration, Patricia. Yeah, she is. And your dad sounds amazing too. I would love to hear hear some stories from him and hear his perspective because um, this is really interesting and we need to have these histories and these oral histories and these written histories of perspectives and um and you know what he what he's what he's been through. Um yeah, did he's a talker though, so he doesn't really talk too much about it with me, but he'll answer questions, but he won't go on and tell me a whole story. But that's just his personality. <laughs> well he sounds fantastic um no. and um did, did do you see these these things playing out on the page or did were you able to sort of keep it separate or what's that been like as far as this book yeah the one that you're working on now oh the one that I'm working on right now mm-hmm. um oh it's just been a crazy process it's like I will tell you, I started writing it right after I went to my conference and, mm-hmm. well, not my conference, the Writer's Justice Conference. And it took a year to even get the first draft done. And then, I don't know if you can see, but this whole thing is 
my book, but none of this is actually in the book. Wait, is that your first book? That's Remember Up There on the Wall? No, 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 no. This is my second book. Okay, my first book, I don't know how I got, like, it just, I just wrote. I don't, out, I'm not an outliner. I'm not a planner. But this one, I decided I should probably outline and plan, but it's still, I don't know. I just don't, I don't write like that. Like, I kind of yeah. just, I, and whatever. You, go where the muse, you, you follow the, your muse. Everybody, let's look at Patricia's wall. We're seeing the well, writers. Do you want yeah, let's see your wall. Okay, well, let's see if I can show you without showing you my messy room. Okay. Like, it wow. starts like right there. And then it goes this like right so here. This is so cool. Wait, do not see you. <laughs> and then this, this is, is a series. Wow. And then, yeah. Oh my gosh. Patricia, this is so cool. Everybody, we are seeing the muse at work. We are seeing the artist in her writer den. We are <laughs> oh my God art happening look at all yeah, of those notes look at all the things stretched out look at all the post-its this is so cool this is really really awesome thank you for showing us um for showing us the inner workings i'm so excited to see your next book um wow so back to remember was yeah. that the first title that you thought of was that number 100 was it somewhere in the middle did it arrive as a stroke of genius or did you have to put it up on the wall and work your way through. Tell us about the title and the cover. Um, okay, so interesting story with the title. The title was originally called Dear Dad and it was originally written. So like I said, it's 12 drafts. The first book was not so much of a, the first draft wasn't so much of a mystery thriller actually. It was more of a young adult relationship with her and her dad. So it's just gonna be an emotional book um, called Dear Dad. But then like, then I had a lot of crazy stuff happen in it. And I was like, this is not an emotional, like heartwarming book anymore. <laughs> um, and so I went to, <laughs> I went to dad, the- You're canceled. Your dad is like, no, this is too soft. Your dad is too <laughs> soft. But I still pitched it actually to Chantel as dear dad. And I actually changed it because it's a weird process on how I got published. But I went to this conference and there was one editor there. I was trying to find an agent, but there was one editor there, but she was only accepting thrillers. I did not think that my Dear Dad Young Adult book was a thriller, but every, I was in a young adult group and they all told me my book was a thriller. I'm like, what? <laughs> what do you mean it's a thriller? And they were like, yeah, you should do that. Like your book is just, just like do it, change your pitch up a little bit, which I thought was weird. I'm like, I'm going to change my pitch, but the book is still the book, whatever. So I pitched it to Chantel as Dear Dad, a psychological thriller that my <laughs> new friends just told me that it is. And I, it's crazy, four months later, she's like, like she's down, she wants it. But I did change the title, like when I sent her a follow-up email and I was hoping she just didn't notice. <laughs> I was hoping she didn't notice, like, wait, you said Dear Dad in person. <laughs> did she notice? I don't think so, I don't like, I don't think so. so. You never addressed it. You just, you just. I guess not. It. No, because I, because Dear Dad is gone. It's dead. Like it's remember. <laughs> we do not remember that it once was Dear Dad. No. Nope. <laughs> exactly. It's a like can't wait. Thriller. <laughs> like it's if halfway theory. through this interview, halfway through this interview, I tell you that my name is Annabelle, and then you just pretend that I never said it was Sarah. We just keep going. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love it. Cody says, it is leadership to speak openly about your experiences and perspectives with mental illness and addiction. Cody, I totally agree. Patricia, we honor you. Um, we we honor you for that. Oh, I'm seeing some questions here. I just I accidentally just scrolled through. Hey, scroll questions past. from the audience are scary because yeah. they're not prepared for that. No, you're doing such a great job. This is amazing. Um, I'm just making sure that we didn't miss any um, Cody says, it is tragic how Portia is treated by the people who claim to love her. Can you tell us yeah. about that? Yeah. Um, it's so weird because when I'm writing it, I didn't really think it was that tragic. It's just normal, you know, <laughs> not saying I was treated that way with my mental illness, but it definitely did get swept under a rug a little bit, or it was like, oh, this is a phase or whatever. So, and I think that happens a lot in families. A lot of people just don't want to admit also, there's a side of it, like for some people, it's not, it. for some teenagers, it is just a phase and some for, it's not mental illness for everyone. So for a parent 
to not know, like to not like, wait, is this a phase or does she really need help, you know? Um, but I, if I can, I'm not a professional by any means, but I will say like, there's nothing wrong with that one therapy session. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Just trying to see, you know, and then finding out for yourself if it's a phase or if it's something more serious. And so if Portia would have just had her mom or her dad just be like, wait, maybe we should see someone about this. Like you can't go to your sister's play because you have social anxiety disorder. Like maybe you need to go get help instead of like just get getting mad at her, you know, like get over it. I, a lot of us are told to just get over it, like grow up. Yes. A lot of us are told to get over anxieties or depression, just get over it, be happy or, you know, get over it, be calm. And yeah, or um, stop being so negative. That's what I, I'm so Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I exactly. Still- and minimizing it is not helpful. Um, on that note, I actually want to say I am blessed to have three incredibly beautiful women of color um, therapist friends, friends who happen to be mental health professional, professionals. Super. So I will link them in the comments, but it is Dr. Pilar Tucker. I actually just did oh, an hour and a half um, Zoom this morning with her. We're coming up with some amazing content um, for her. Um, Dr. Samia Dave, she's a psychiatrist. Um, and um, Jenny Be My Therapist is her handle on Instagram. Jenny, my friend in Philadelphia, another mental health professional. All three are women of color. All three are amazing therapists. All three are very, very good friends of mine. Um, and so all people, I recommend everyone follow them um, because we need to be talking more about mental health. And here's three really radiant, light-filled um, sources of uh, information for everybody who wants to talk about it to start with. Um, we have another question from, the, we actually have two. Um, Leah says, I love hearing the stories behind your titles, Patricia, amazing. Um, and someone would like to know more about your writing group. Yeah, let's hear more about this writing group. This writing group that said to you, girl, you're, not, you're writing a thriller, not a, not a dear dad. Um, oh, okay. Sure. Tell us. Um, so it was the Writers Digest Conference 2018, August 2019. I'll never forget it. It's changed my life. Um, I was August 9th. So like, um, I was going to New York for the very, very first time. And there was a Facebook group. And I think I posted on Facebook group, I've never been to New York before. I'm scared, What like, is there something I should do? And then like, what do you write? I'm like, I write young adult. And um, there was this young adult sure. group. This is in the Facebook group of the conference attendees. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so this you post randomly, not knowing anybody, having never been to New York, you post in the group of attendees. And could you say one more time the name of the conference, Patricia? Writer's Digest. Writers Digest Conference. Okay, so you post, and then three random people and people people randomly that you've never met start replying. Yes. So most of them were tips of what to do in New York, um, or maybe it was another group. I hope they're watching right now and probably can like, be like no, this didn't happen like this. It happened like this. <laughs> and so, and that's not remember, right? Everyone remembers differently. <laughs> I've never um, read your book. Yeah, and so basically there was a group. The point is that there was a young adult group within the writer's digest and we wanted to meet up there and it was interesting because we all wrote young adult but different genres like there was young adult fantasy there was young adult like sci-fi all of it and um I was young adult crime and so we practiced our I was just trying to get an agent and so we just practiced our pitches with each other and my pitch sucked (laughs) they didn't tell me that but their faces did (laughs) wait let's see the face can you reenact it was it like they were just like uh uh, were they like, they, so what's happening? <laughs> what's this work about? And so, um, then one girl, like she, like they all like gave gave me their tips, but I just felt like, okay, well, this is over, because I'm like an extremist. Like if I mess up, like that means I'm giving up. I'm like, done. I I should go home right now. I'm gonna just go back to that work and try next time but they didn't let me you know they we went out to dinner and they helped me redo my pitch and I redid my pitch and then I missed out on the sessions before the pitch and went to Central Park and just meditated and practiced my new pitch and I was just like it is what it is I'm gonna just do this new pitch that I just learned last night and it worked it's happened yay and was it one of those things where it was like a speed dating pitcher pitcher whatever they call yeah, it. Yeah, it was pitch. 
Yeah. Okay. So you went table to table and you just pitched, 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 pitched. Yeah. I mean, I will tell you this. If you buy pitch land, please take advantage of it and go to as many agents as you did. Unlike me, <laughs> I went to just two people because they're like, send me a full. I'm like, great. I'm out. I'm in. I'm out. And today I don't have it. Like, I don't have an agent. I should have just kept going. <laughs> Wait, so you, so two people told you, send me the full manuscript and you were like, I, that, well, you know, I've done my work here. Yeah. Don't do that. But to be fair, Patricia, that's pretty freaking amazing. Like that is yeah. pretty damn amazing. Not everybody gets that. Um, I know. So that is, take that in. Like that is a, a, a credit to you and your work. Um, that that happened for you. I mean, that really speaks lovely to the caliber of writer that you are and to the caliber of your writing because a lot of people don't get that. So I just want you to receive that, that yeah. that's a credit to your talent, you know? Yeah, thanks. So then, so what, so did you end up working with one of those two people or how did it work next? Um, so, okay, so I had an agent tell me to send a fool and then I had the editor send me a fool and the editor was Chantel. And so, um, it definitely worked, but the agent didn't say anything. And so I got, so I just don't have an agent. That was the only, that's the only reason why I feel like I should have kept going. Um, but I definitely recommend doing that, L like buying conference tickets and going and just experiencing it for the full, because I send queries all the time. I've been sending queries all the time. And then I go in, in person and I get an offer like what? So... <laughs> Um, yeah. definitely doing that. And was Chantal the editor at Polis? Yes. Okay, cool. So for everyone who doesn't know, Polis Books is Patricia's publisher. Um, and we should also acknowledge the fact that Patricia's book um, made its cover reveal in Await Entertainment Weekly, um, which is, what was that like to see your book on Entertainment Weekly? Well, it was a, it was a couple of things. It was also Publishers Weekly and um, there was just a lot going on. Because, okay, well, I will tell you that Chantel leads a, the Agora imprint, which focuses more on diverse authors of crime. And so it's like me, Tori Eldridge, and John Vercher, and we were the first authors of this new imprint. And it was really cool to just do this all together because um, their books are amazing. And we were just in it together. And so we were doing these interviews together. We were in, um, we were in these magazines together and it was just, I don't know, it was definitely a movement, you know, it started this conversation that was long overdue with diverse authors, you know, and it's really cool that Jason allowed Chantel to do this and to just make a whole imprint like focused on that. Like that doesn't happen, like, you know, so I, it was, it was an honor to be a part of that, I, I'll say. Oh, that's so amazing. And for everybody watching, so Jason is Jason Pinter, who I interviewed last Monday. Um, he is also an author in his own right of most recently Hideaway, which is a thriller as well. Um, and Jason is also the founder of Polis Books and Polis is Patricia's publisher. Um, and I have to say, after talking to Jason, um, he's super woke, especially for a white guy. <laughs> he's yeah. awesome. He, he is. He's super woke and he, um, for those of you who, who didn't catch the interview, it's available up above um, in our videos. And so Rachel, so his lead character is an ass-kicking single mom, Rachel Marin. Um, Jason wrote a book with a cast of very diverse, wonderfully inclusive characters. So Jason is really walking the walk, both in his own books and in his in, in his um, publishing company, Polis and the imprint Agora. So, so that's really cool. And we have to give a shout out to Jason for doing that. Yeah. Awesome work. And for, to Patricia and, um, and, and for taking that risk and, and doing that. And it's really cool to see. Yeah. So I'll, on that note, I'll piggyback, right. It's interesting because a lot of um, businesses that are now supporting like, um, more diverse people they're getting slack because they weren't doing it before and like they're like oh now you want to put a black girl up or now you want to talk like well like they're, they're putting up the hashtags that never hired a black model before or like they're just getting slack for it but it's Jason was on top of it he's been on top of it he's like these others are already published like we got it <laughs> yeah so exactly. I thought that was cool that is super cool and I have to say I'm 
I totally hear what you're saying and I agree with you um, because I, on one hand, I'm so happy to see the attention and the the new attention and the and people finally getting woke and getting on board at the same time having myself <laughs> tried to be woke for <laughs> you know walking the woke walk for a good number of years i'm like what the hell took you guys so long like thanks for catching yeah up. yeah um, that's that was what i was thinking yeah yeah it's frustrating right because it's like uh hello i you know i've been supporting black authors and doing buying from black owned, black owned businesses and, you know, doing giveaways for black authors. And I wasn't hashtagging it, you know, support black authors or support black businesses. I was, walking to do. Yeah. I was voting with my wallet and I was just getting it done. Um, yeah. And so it feels a little, it's on one hand, I'm grateful and I'm glad that the conversation is happening. On the other hand, I'm like, why, what the hell took you so long? And it's crazy. Yeah. You know? So I'm imagining that as a black author, it feels even more that way for you. Yeah, I mean, it's, don't get me wrong, like, this whole thing, I have, like, a range of emotions, like, I'm super happy that the change is happening, and that all this is going on, and that so many people, like, the other day, there's 50k people, like, literally right up the street supporting this, and it's amazing, but then, then I get sad, like, then I get angry, I was like, well, why didn't you do this before, like, George Floyd is not the first black person to die, like, you know what I mean, and then, then I get, like, sad because like got, these people had to die for this and so I mean I don't know it's bittersweet it's it's amazing but overall it's amazing change is happening and I, I just hope I'll say this I just hope that it keeps going when people go back to work and people aren't bored because they don't have stagecoach and Coachella and they have other things to do I just hope they don't forget about us I guess so I, say frankly I probably shouldn't have said it that way I obviously cannot speak for for all white people or for our whole culture, but I I can say that from my perspective, I don't think that anyone will forget about this. I think once the veil is lifted and once your eyes are opened, I I don't I cannot imagine that anyone could go back to being unwoke. <laughs> like I can't imagine that anyone would go back to their previously sleepy state. Um, once you're aware, you can't forget what what is going on and what is happening yeah. and and the call to be part of it. So I think this is just the awakening and I think we all need to be doing our part to keep it going, but I, I really, I can't imagine that we wouldn't. Yeah. So Patricia, for this book, have you ever um, imagined it on either the big screen or as a Netflix series? Uh, yeah, so it's interesting. I, I feel like that I shouldn't admit this, but when I write books, I imagine the scene. And I imagine the characters, I imagine it on television. Um, and so I definitely see it on screen, but I don't know if I, I, I see it like in a movie theater, I see it as like an indie film, like maybe Sundance or, <laughs> I mean, I guess I can see it as a series, but, but if it's a series, like that's more opportunity for them to mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. If it's a movie exactly. and best believe I'm going to be involved. Just saying. Yeah, good. Absolutely. You Especially should be. Especially with mental illness, like it could go so wrong on yeah, television. Exactly. So exactly. I definitely want to like make sure it doesn't do that and it doesn't make it worse, you know? Absolutely. And I appreciate that responsibility and that, that ownership that you feel for it in protecting the story. I totally get that. Yeah. Have you cast it in your head? Who would play? Oh, for sure. Tell us all the things. Um, Zoe Kravitz is going to be Portia. Oh my god, I love her. <laughs> I can totally see it. Um, I wanted Morgan Freeman to be my dad, but I think he's too old for my dad. No, he's not. He's not too yeah. old. He's perfect. Well, I guess if it's real life, he's definitely not too old because if it's like if it's the same age difference of me and my dad, then it works perfectly. But the, I mean, Portia's not me. Like. <laughs> I think I just love Morgan Freeman so much. I need him to be in all the movies. I mean, he's been the voice of God. That man is God. Yeah. He can do anything. No, I think he's like a, a great Richard Willows. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Um, what is your favorite scene from the book? Ooh, uh, my, oh, I guess my favorite scene from the book would be the the 
it's in the beginning, so I'm not giving away anything. Um, when she first hangs out with her love interest, interest Ethan, and they, she, Ethan takes her to the UCLA bookstore, and she has social anxiety disorder. So um, when she walks in and she immediately wants to turn around, but then Ethan stops her, I will tell you a secret. Um, that was inspired by the scene in A Walk to Remember because I'm a diehard hopeless romantic. <laughs> Also, I just love writing romantic scenes that never happened to me in real life. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So everybody out there, take note of what yes. this ideal date would be. It involves a bookstore and a secret. Get it right. Rem um, rem everybody needs to remember that. <laughs> yeah. So any of the like little tiny romantic like things that they do or how Ethan talks to her or like how she just feels so comfortable with him that's those are my favorite scenes to write because they don't they don't take much you know they're just like they just add to the story exactly. and it's just like it's just me yeah I love, yeah I'll, I'll stop <laughs> no I love it this is so awesome um I, you know it's crazy I just saw I just saw the tie the clock at the bottom of my computer we've been talking for 42 minutes I can't believe it it seems like two minutes um yeah. but I do want to be mindful of the time and so let's oh, we're getting hearts hearts up from the audience thank you guys for the hearts um, let's enter the lightning round. Patricia, are you ready? Oh God, yeah. Okay, are you a morning or afternoon writer? Afternoon. Do you prefer chocolate or vanilla? Vanilla. I like chocolate. <laughs> now, I'm, I, my next question is beach or mountains, but I already, already stalked your or Instagram. I know what it is, but for the people at home, beach or mountains, are you reading in your ideal location, beach or mountains? Wait, mountains, but what do you think it was? Uh, all those bikini shots on the beach. <laughs> Okay, I knew you were gonna think that, but no, I just live on the beach. <laughs> I just live near the beach. Oh my God, I'm so jealous that you live at the beach. That's amazing. I Cause I was looking, everybody go everybody go follow Patricia on Instagram, go follow her on Twitter. We're, um, we're dropping the links below, but um, Patricia has beautiful- I love the beach, don't get me wrong, but I, I'm, I would love to just go to the mountains. Okay, this is good to know. I'm glad I asked because I almost skipped it because I'm like, she loves the beach. Look at her Instagram. <laughs> I do. But I have mountains tattooed on me. I did not know that. Okay, cool. See, I'm so glad I asked. Um, what's your weirdest writing ritual? Show, show us your weird. Share us. Share with us your weird. Okay, so interesting. I was talking to a friend about this and I thought that the weirdest thing I do is watch TV while I write. And he's like, um, it's definitely like that you write on your walls. <laughs> so um, I don't know. <laughs> what is weird to you guys? I think it depends. Um, I think it's weird to watch TV because usually like your mind can't be at two different things, but it can't, it can't. Well, Sarah Slager t uh, told, uh, told us a couple weeks ago that she writes listening to ABBA while writes her mysteries and thrillers while listening to ABBA and also blasting coffee shop noise from her computer so she could pretend she's a, at a coffee shop while still quarantined at home. <laughs> that is so cool. I also listen to heavy metal, but I don't think that's weird. That's just okay. facts. <laughs> well, that actually was my question. Is, is, is the soundtrack to your book. Okay, good to know. Heavy metal did not see that coming. <laughs> but I guess after ABBA and Sarah yeah, Slayer, I have, ABBA, my, I have yeah. my bands. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh i wow okay cool um truth or dare dare Woo. okay got dog or cat dog who's a writer you're dying to meet Susanna kaysen okay cool. wait i think you're i think you froze for one second can you tell us again Susanna kaysen Susanna kaysen okay cool um what's your favorite movie the notebook oh my gosh that's one of my favorite movies too. Oh, where I've seen it so many times where he's like, where the, I, my favorite scene is where they're, they're having the fight scene out. out, out yeah, the so there's a, there's, a tick, there's a TikTok version. Oh, there is? What? Okay, you've just changed my life. I need to go check this out. Where he's yeah. like, we're going to fight. We're going to keep fighting. Yeah. You, you tell me when I'm being an arrogant son of a bitch and I'm going to tell you when you're being a pain in the ass, but you are 99% of the time. Exactly. And then you have like three second rebound rate and then you go to the next pain in the ass thing. It's yeah, going to be hard. <laughs> Look, I have it right here. I'll show you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and then they kiss. Yes. Oh my God. It's my favorite scene too. I feel like we could yeah. do, exactly. We could just quote the lines back and forth to each other. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I got my husband a, a coffee mug that says, I speak fluent movie quotes. And like, yeah, if you're a bird, I'm a bird. Exactly. If you're a bird, I'm a bird. Oh my gosh, totally. Oh, I love this so much. Okay, cool. Um, would you rather take, would you rather go camping with Bram Stoker or Anne Rice? Anne Rice, how to look them up, but Anne Rice. Okay. Um, what is one book that changed your life? Girl Interrupted. Oh my gosh, that was such a powerful movie. That is such a powerful What is one word that gives you the heebie-jeebies? I mean, I can't say it because it's going to give me the heebie-jeebies, so I'll okay, spell tell it us for you. It tell us what it rhymes with. No, because that's, that's, that's why it's, I'll just spell it for you. Okay. Okay. Or no, and you can guess it. It's what happens when a guy, when a little boy goes into a, a man and his voice changes, starts with a P. Don't, please don't say it. Oh, okay, okay. And, you okay. know it though. Okay, yeah. we know what that is. Okay, <laughs> and we will and we will never say it. A lot of people say moist, and moist doesn't bother me because it reminds me of like moist chocolate cake, moist chocolate. Chip I mean, cookies. it's like it's not the greatest word. I have a lot of words <laughs> I just don't like. Yeah, I have. <laughs> but that okay. one that I just told you about, like I like it hurts. It hurts my body. <laughs> Interesting. Is it the sound of it or what it stands for? Yeah, it's. No, just the sound of it, like the first. So I hope I'm going to have, like, if I have a son, we're just going to have to, and he goes through that, we're just not going to be talking about it. Yeah, we're not talking about it. What's happening to me, mom? Zip it. Zip it. <laughs> oh, it's this thing that we cannot say. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. So the, <laughs> um, okay, Patricia, last question. Okay. Tell me who would you rather be stuck in Area 54 with? And for the audience, Area 54 is a super scary um, part of New Mexico where a lot of alien activity has happened. Um, the, supposedly the government has like, you know, roped off with barbed wire fences, place where aliens and spacecraft have crashed. And there's a lot of crazy shit happening, on, happening in Area 54. So Patricia, would you rather be stuck overnight in Area 54 with Stephen King, the horror king, or H.P. Lovecraft? Stephen King, but A, Stephen King, because he's amazing, but also because I have no idea who H.P. Lovecraft is. <laughs> I have to all. admit, I Googled scariest thriller writers, and then I just wrote them down. I have never read H.P. Lovecraft myself either. True confession. It sounds like it's a, per it's a thing, not even a person. <laughs> exactly. I feel like Stephen King is a good choice because A, while you're not sleeping, because let's be honest, you ain't getting no sleep in Area 54. Like you're not closing your eyes. Yeah. You're not going to get your eight hours. You're not going to hit REM five. You're going to be like up all night, yeah. terrified. You could pick his brain. You could like talk about yeah. writing. Or you and can just write a book together. Oh my God, you could write a book together. And also if there is an alien, Stephen King is probably going to know the zombie kill shot. Yeah, or know what to do. Right? Or he'll just help me calm down. <laughs> Right, we're getting laughter. We're getting laughter from the audience. They are saying we love Stephen King so much. Oh my God, amazing. Patricia, it has been such a joy talking with you. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us online. Um, we cannot wait to read your book. We're so excited. And we can't read, wait to read book number two. So get back to those walls, marking them up. We need yeah. you to write yeah. your heart out. Um, I'm pulling up my copy too. Um, it has been so, so cool talking with you remember um out now grab a copy through our special partnership with bookshop.org which supports indie bookstores we love indie bookstores so buy remember through the link below patricia thank you so much everybody we thank you so much for having me this was so much fun i was so nervous for you're so cool oh oh my gosh thank you so much high praise from you queen thank <laughs> you so much rena says hi ladies hi rena good to have you um, thank you so, so much. And everybody, we will see you next time. Um, Rena says, we will remember. Yeah, Rena, we are on board with that. Um, and everybody, be sure to follow Patricia, check her out. And we cannot wait to see. Um, we can't wait to see where you go, girl. You're amazing. Thank you so much. Okay.